Yep. You heard it here first. A lot of. A lot of had a lot of words. <laughs> I tried to keep it straight, but a lot of had a lot of words about functional analysis, and we're going to really hammer the point home to you today about the value of functional analysis, um, because we have a really hard hitting article <laughs> for you, um, and that is a lot of and a bunch of other probably people that are really annoyed at me at this point. Um, it's okay, I thought you nailed it. <laughs> oh, ooh, that's uh, the water definitely did. Anyway. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, oh my gosh, here we go. I get. I, I don't think we need the hammer. I can get, get out of line with this thing, so I'm going to put that away. Um, <clears throat> so, toward a functional analysis of self-injury, maybe I should get the hammer back. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, props. There we go. So, toward a functional analysis of self-injury, folks, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, it's an article. It was published and no, you don't need to know all that crap. Anyway, so notes. Here we go. Um, because notes. So end notes and there's things that we gotta look at and journals and everything else. Anyway, so uh what are we doing? Well, first off, y'all know what a functional analysis is, because if you don't, you probably wouldn't be watching our videos. Um, because there would be no point in watching our videos if you didn't know what it was. And if you do know what it is as a result of our videos, then congratulations, we've done well. If you learned it from another faculty member, then even better. So let's see, or not, I don't know. So let's, ooh, notes, here we go. So we're not gonna go through every item in the article, but I just wanna hit some major points for you because it's a, it's a good one. Um, there is a lot of words, but uh, um, a lot of was careful with them. <laughs> um, so here we go. 94, that was the year I graduated high school. So this article makes me feel old, so, which I guess I should. Uh, 1994 goal was to define a procedure, right? So the idea is with functional analysis. Now I'm going to take a little sidestep here. I have a phrase that I like to use. I have FB big A and FB little A. Um, so FB big A was what everyone else just calls an FA. Um, so functional analysis. Um, the other one is functional behavioral assessment, right? So I like to keep the assessment small and the analysis big. Um, and the reason is because with an analysis, you have experimental control, right? So I think that's one of the things that's important about the articles. It demonstrates experimental control to try and understand what the function of a response is. In this case, we're talking about self-injurious behavior. Be behavior. Be hammer? <laughs> oh, I've been besmirched with a hammer. Um, so, anyway, no... Anyway, though the behavior in question was headbanging. <laughs> now, you'd think that I don't have that... Probably from doing that a bit too much, but you get the idea. So head, out of these subjects, that nine subjects, uh, most of the, the responses were headbang, what were the problems, right? Um, so we're going to come back to that in a second, though. So he did use a multi-element design, which is a classic functional analysis procedure. Um, and one of the reasons, as you read through the article, that he and his colleagues were doing this was because even in 94, they were trying to move away from uh, punishment-based interventions, not just because of the ethical piece, but because of the functional piece. Like, uh, a punishment-based punishment intervention doesn't last long. It works while you're delivering the punisher, and then it doesn't, you gotta train a new response in the context. So it's great to get things under control, but it's not something that's permanent. So if you can find something that's much more permanent, much more lasting, much more generalizable, then you should. So they were trying to do that. And the thing that they thought most was, listen, if we're gonna only focus on punishment of self-injurious behavior, then we're not figuring out the function of the behavior. If we're not figuring out the function of the behavior, we're not gonna find a replacement for it. Blah, 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 you get the idea. Um, so they set out to figure out how to do that. So y'all know what this stuff's about. It's really simple. You have four different conditions that they're operating under. One of them is a control condition, right? So that control condition is just where there's toys in the room, there's uh, the researchers in the room, or whoever it is that's doing the FA is in the room. Um, they're kind of hanging out. They're not really interacting. They're providing some social responses and reinforcement as prompted, not, but not, not, not overdoing it. Just kind of just there, all right? Think of it that way. Um, uh, in the room, and the kiddos are allowed to just do their subjects, whatever you want to say, are just allowed to be themselves and SIB as needed. And so that brings up another point that we're going to come back to after I talk about the four conditions, which is that SIB uh, was allowed in this particular experiment, which is going to get us back to an ethical issue in the institutional review boards. So the other conditions we had social disapproval, which is Brett, stop doing what you're doing right now. I've had enough of it. It's crazy. I can't deal with your hips moving like that. <laughs> um, so 
and social disapproval, of course, being a uh, attention type condition. Uh, then we also have academic demands. Brad, sit down. So, um, and then maybe an escape for that, uh, right? So that's an escape scenario. So, and the act, so the idea would be that the um, the self injurious behavior would go crazy uh, when you're put on uh, when you're given an academic demand. Demand. And the other one is unstructured play, uh, which is the one we already talked about. That's the control condition, and then the loan, right? So that gets you your automatic stuff. So um, these four conditions um, you're done as a multi element design. Um, they had two sessions per condition daily. Each session was 15 minutes. Conditions were there were four total conditions. We've already talked about them. They're presented in a random presented in a random order to control for sequence effects. There's a whole bunch of research articles on why they should and shouldn't do that by the way so feel free to dig deep into that one because i went down that rabbit hole this morning and went oh my gosh i don't have time to present all this stuff but there's tons out there about why sometimes you might not actually want to control or randomize the order of things because um, you're setting up establishing operations every time you present each one of these different conditions and it could have a carryover effect to the next one you want to maximize that and minimize it under certain conditions there's just, just so much to think about and worry about just do what you can Okay, just remember that. Just do what you can. All right, so I promised you I would go back to the IRB. The IRB is the uh, um, ethical body that governs um, research uh, with human subjects. Now there's a different one for non-human subjects, which is probably actually more strict. Um, in fact, it is, because they can't speak for themselves. But anyway, in this case, they allowed... Um, they allowed for a self-injurious behavior to happen. You had to in order to track it, right? So, uh, but what do you do with that? Well, you have to have a certain set of procedures put in place in order to make sure that all the ethical protections are there for the client and the client's going to be safe. In this case, they even talked to the doctors um, and they had uh, of, of the clients and they had termination criteria about if something happened or too much happened or whatever, they would terminate that particular session. So there's no reason to cause, to, to cause lasting harm to the client um, in these particular instances. So let's move on. Um, basically, what they found was that you can, uh, the term that you're going to run into here is differentiate, right? Um, so you can differentiate what behavior or what condition is maintaining behavior so you can identify what reinforcers are maintaining particular behaviors or likely are maintaining behaviors. In those differentiated conditions, once you find that out, now you can target your interventions based on those, you know, that, that function of the behavior. Surprise, surprise, it's something we all take for granted, but um, keep in mind that science changes, so this was a, a growing thing, and now it's popular, but at the time it was just kind of really catching on. Um, so uh, the, the, the references, or the um, figure one goes over some cool stuff. Now, I did note that um, it, it's nice that standard deviations from the marine are presented here. Why? Because I always find it funny that behavior analysts hate statistics usually, um, but here's the case. You must use your statistics and understand them in order to understand the graph. I love it. Good job, Awata. Um, so, Awata likes statistics too. How nice. Uh, maybe he doesn't. I don't know. But they did it. Sometimes it's just the journal articles that make you do that. Um, let's see what else we got. Oh, so the graphs are pretty self-explanatory. Um, under, in figure one, you can see where, uh, w which condition the headbanging happened the most in, or the self-injurious behavior, I should say, because it's different for each client. Um, and sometimes it's non-differentiated, which means it happened in multiple things. Now, there's going to be another um, one of these things, behavior digests, where we talk about that particular issue. So anyway, so non-differentiated, it's a little harder to develop your interventions. And you might do a follow-up, and sometimes they do. Um, so anyway, and oh, figure two. Figure two goes over percentage of 10 second intervals. Oh, 10 second intervals, that's the thing I wanted to talk about. I'm going to digress a little bit here into 10 second intervals. Now, the idea is that when you're doing interval-based data collection, some people are like, oh, it's always two minute intervals. And some people are like, no, it's 10 second intervals. Could be an hour, could be a day. Like, it depends on the behavior and the client and the situation that you're in, folks. Just because you read an article that had 10 seconds in it doesn't mean you have to stick with that for the rest of your academic or your, for the rest of your behavior analytic career. There's no point in it. I have heard that stagnation over and over again. And sometimes people are like, wow, you can totally change the interval? Like, uh-huh, <laughs> you can. It's cool. Base it off of your client, please. Anyway, there we go. So what's cool about the article is that when you have problem behavior, if you study the functions of the behavior, you can really pin down your types of interventions that you want to do. So I think this is literally the essence of quality behavioral intervention design is getting this type of information. Now, remember we said FB big A and FB little a. Sometimes it's just not possible to do all this stuff. Ideally, you can. Ideally, this should be every kiddo with, with problem behavior. You engage in one of these types of things over time. Maybe it's not all out at once. Maybe it's over a, a span of weeks. And in some instances, it is. Uh, where if, if you've got a BCBA that's overseeing a certain number of clients, they might not be able to pull one of these off in a week. It might take two, three, four weeks to fully get this thing figured out. So, anyway, what else other notes do I have here? 
target interventions. Oh, the analog scenario. That's an important one. So other videos I've talked about how you want real scenarios and not analog ones or contrived ones. But in this case, you do want the contrived one. It allows you to rule out all that other stuff out there and then really nail down on what is reinforcing the behavior. Um, and then something about baselines must. Huh. Anyway, I forget. So sometimes I make notes and I can't even read them. So there you go. I think that's it for Iwata. Um, I hope um, I had my, my Iwata words were good enough for Iwata's article. So 